Best Book Beats podcast brings you Jason Pulowski, author of Foods for Thought, on a personal mission to empower and educate others to take charge of their own health and wellness outcomes. Jason, thank you for being on the podcast. Hey, good morning. Yeah, my pleasure. I'm glad to be here with you today, Michael. Thank you for having me. No problem. Whereabouts are you from? Uh, so I'm born and raised in Phoenix, Arizona, in the southwestern United States. Um, so I um, went to college down here at Arizona State University and then back to graduate school there. Started my career uh, in Yuma, Arizona, down by the Mexico-California border, um, and just kind of got a couple years experience, general clinical experience as a dietitian. And then the next chapter after those couple years, that's when it kind of uh, opened up the door to uh, a specializing as a dietitian, and I kind of fell into that specialty of nutrition for mental health. So I'll unpack that a little bit more as we talk there. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, I want to sort of deep dive and people that um, don't know who you are or what you do, basically take take me back to working with sort of hardcore addicts, uh, with uh, hardcore addicts and, and co-occurring mental health issues that were just days uh, clean from opiates and, and a myriad of other substances. Take us back to working with hardcore addicts. Yeah, so uh, I work cur- and still currently I'm full time uh, work uh, for a nonprofit organization. So we're an uh, integrated uh, healthcare, uh, behavioral health led organization. So basically, that means our background is about 50, almost 60 years in uh, Arizona as one of the main behavioral health ag- uh, agencies. So mainly uh, substance abuse counseling, family counseling. Um, different therapy services, medications, and so forth for psychiatric medications, outpatient services. So that's our background in the past 50 plus years, but the past decade or so we've expanded to primary care services where the uh, medical providers are working in there and working close with the dietitian and the therapist. And I'm the first and only dietitian to come uh, and be added to that integrated model of healthcare. So a lot of the folks that I work with have not just whether it's diabetes or high blood pressure or high cholesterol that I'm trying to help them with, but they're also coming to the same clinic to get some help with their, with their co-occurring uh, mental health diagnosis, such as whether it's anxiety, bipolar, depression, um, sometimes you know schizophrenia, the more serious mental illnesses also that sometimes I do see folks um, that are dealing with some of those more complex mental illnesses. Yeah, yeah. I read your book, and it's a it's an amazing book, and it goes into the relationship between um, what we're going to talk about today on the podcast is mental health and well being, and food and that relationship as well. So, um, talk to us how you sort of early on started that connection and realized that hang on a second, food, mental health, behavior, it all links in. So, um, yeah, talk talk a little bit about how it started. Yeah. So. Uh you know, so traditionally, dietitians don't, in academia, we don't learn much about mental health. Now, I hope the tides are changing in recent years, since my years out of academia, I hope it is changing. But, you know, in my years in academia, we just didn't learn much background about mental health. You know, so after I had a couple years experience and just working in different clinics like the cancer center, weight loss surgery, um, uh, cardiac uh, rehab, child rehab services, all these different specialties I worked in, I really wanted to specialize and work on one challenging population. So I ended up leaving my first clinical position in Yuma, Arizona. And then I had my heart set on dialysis and helping folks with kidney problems. But I ended up out of serendipity, I ended up getting swayed away from that direction, going and applying to random jobs. And I fell in and I noticed this position for behavioral health agency. And I had never thought about that before. So I was like, wait a second, this might be that challenging population I'm looking for that I get to specialize in. So I ended up applying and I started working there. So that's kind of serendipity, how I ended up falling into that specialization of behavioral health and mental health. That was about four and a half years ago is when I started there. Yeah, great. Yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for ex- expanding that for me. Um, we're going to kick off the book. You 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 basically start off and talk about the the sad diet, which is the standard American uh, diet, um, obviously typically described as being nutrient deficient uh, and consumed by so many Americans and people around the world as well. Um, Obviously, the link that you say in the book, it's, it's neutrally inadequate diet that can lead to even worse in mental health. Um, do you want to start there and explore how it all sort of started uh, with the SAD diet? 
Yeah. And, 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 you know, one realization I think that's very important that we have to kind of start with the caveat here is that when I started thinking about this book and I wanted to write about nutrition for mental health, I quickly realized I could not frame the entire conversation around nutrition for mental health. What I mean by that is I couldn't have this conversation without acknowledging the importance of other self-care factors that are critical to our mental health. Are we sleeping enough? Are we resting? Are we managing our stress? Are we staying connected with meaningful relationships, our loved ones? All those things that contribute to our mental well-being. So I got I to gotta be careful and first acknowledge that this, a lot of this discussion is very nuanced. And a lot of it's not very clearly cause and effect with the research I'm exploring. So it's a lot more correlation research I'm exploring. So just that bit of caveat there. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you do unpack that in the book as well. And one of the good quotes I got from it was high stress plus lack of self-care plus poor diet. It equals a recipe for disaster. Is that correct? That's kind of my general assessment. And what I gathered that I see as a pattern with a lot of folks I help in clinic is that, yeah. So what I'm saying there to your kind of broader question you just asked me is that that diet piece and that poor diet, that standard American diet, perhaps, that's arguably one of those biggest factors for a lot of folks, maybe why we're just feeling on edge, maybe we can't relax. You know, so there's that that link with perhaps contributing to some generalized anxiety, for example. Um, But then there's some more stronger links that we have to more explore in clinical research, such as uh, major depression, and that deficiency of omega threes, that research link is a little bit more clear than when we're looking at anxiety related disorders. So that's one that really piques my interest as a clinician and looking forward to the research in near in the near future about helping us understand how when we correct those uh, essential fat deficiencies that might in some cases help treat or might be an adjuvant part of treatment for major depression. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to, uh, we'll circle back to that and, and, and deep dive in a sec on that. But uh, in let's go back to the past. So where, how did it all start? So the Health Nation, uh, you talk about in the book in the, do you have a copy of the book there on you as well? You can, you can show the audience too. Yeah. yeah. The front cover there. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Beautiful. Food for thoughts. Understand the impact of diet and lifestyle on mental health. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Cool, uh, cool cover. I like it. Yeah, we'll go back first. So the 70s and 80s, you talk about how the industry, uh, the food industry has been taken um, food processing to a new level, not just food processing, but labeling as well. Uh, Is there anything you can add onto that, uh, Jason? Yeah, um, you know, I I, I, I don't want to expand too much on that because I feel like it's just one significant point in history that we have to acknowledge that that's when I feel like we've seen some dramatic shifts with the patterns of how we were eating. Now, when I say we, I'm I'm talking not just the United States, but different developed nations that also followed that same pattern of a lot of highly processed foods and maybe around that time period, the 70s, 80s. Now, yeah, and which leads on to my next question, which is talking about how food is a, the health of a nation is mental health. And in America, you've got, you know, one out of five Americans, approximately nearly uh, 43 million, will experience mental health. Uh, and furthermore, over 10 million in the US are living with serious mental illness. Uh, and you talk about one of the leading causes of disability in the world is, is, is depression. And just making that link between food and the standard American diet and, um, you know, food processing, labeling and packaging. So yeah, just want to jump into a little bit about mental health and um, depression, that correlation with food, which you talk about in the introduction of the book. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think broadly speaking, I think again, that what one of the main themes of the book I tried to highlight was the importance of a balanced pattern of diet. So that's one thing I, I feel that really speaks to the deficiency of those essential nutrients that we need in a balanced diet. When we eat too much standard American diet, too much highly processed snack foods, not enough fruits and vegetables, not enough whole grains, not enough lean proteins, that, that's when I, I find that that is broadly going to contribute to just an unbalanced diet pattern. And it's hard to really nail that down and say and that is causing anxiety, that is causing depression. We can't quite say that. And that's why I had to parse it out and research a little bit more and explore some of those key deficiencies that could be contributing to those different disorders 
that's why part one of the book, I just try to really kind of explore the current state of the research and the different main di- classifications of disorders, such as anxiety-related re- disorders, which the research is a little less clear on that one, and then major depression disorders. I'd say the research is a little more robust on that r- relationship. And then the psychotic and, re- um, and uh, schizophrenia and psychotic-related disorders were some of the main groups of mental health disorders I tried to explore the uh, research links on. Yeah, yeah, it's it's great, and uh, yeah, and with your sort of um, with your work experience and your clinical understanding, yeah, some of those things that you talk about is mood disorders, depression, and bipolar disorders, anxiety related disorders. Uh, if people are suffering for some of these mental health things privately and by themselves, what are the, some of the tips or things you could tell them apart from getting obviously professional professional help? Is there is there anything that they could take away from this conversation quickly that that might might help them uh, that, that you've got some tips on? Yeah, I, I want to park on one word that I, th- I heard you say there was if they're, if they're looking for something along the lines of help, you said by themselves. That's the key word. So I want to make sure that they're connected to a mental health professional first. And, and, and what I mean by that is whether that's maybe their therapist they're working with, you know, at least they're connected with the medical provider and they're at least have that open door if they need to get connected with, a, with maybe a psychiatrist or a therapist. So sometimes if I acknowledge those, those challenges in mental health and they're not connected, I need to make sure that they are first connected or they're at least offered to connect with that therapist. So I, I want to at least say, let's start there before we jump into the diet. So I want to at least make sure that that's a, a, an option on the table, that they're either connected or they know that there is help out there besides just changing their diet. So I don't just want to. I guess what I'm trying to say is acknowledging the limitation of diet. And as I explain in therapy, this is diet is likely a piece of the puzzle, but not necessarily the solution in most cases. But I would argue a piece of the puzzle with helping us feel better, with helping us treat a variety of different mental health disorders in many cases, not all. Yeah, got it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, in chapter two, we you talk about chronic inflammation and uh, are you feeling the fire of depression? I guess a lot of people these days are starting to understand regarding gut health, uh, inflammation. They know what foods trigger X and what foods make them feel better and what foods, foods make them uh, food feel bad as well. Uh, do you want to jump in and talk a little bit about the difference between what is acute or chronic uh, inflammation? Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, this could be a little confusing concept. You know, when I tr- start talking about this in group therapy, I find like a few people are really interested and then a few people I kind of lose. So, you know, you mentioned this is a popular topic. So a lot of folks are hearing about gut health and chronic inflammation lately. Um, but let me unpack that a little bit. You know, so acute inflammation, we might experience, let's say maybe we cut ourselves, we cut our finger, our finger swells up. And then our, our immune system are sending different immune cells to protect ourselves from that, that in, be turning into a, a more problematic infection. So that's an example of acute inflammation when our body deals with something more uh, of an invading attack, so to speak, of different germs getting into our system, trying to prevent that. Now, uh, when our body is in a state of chronic inflammation, that's something different where Perhaps our immune system is being uh, stimulated and responding to different stress factors, whether we're not sleeping, maybe we're just, um, our stress hormones are really high over time. That can contribute to some chronic inflammation. So there's different factors. It's not simply a diet that contributes to chronic inflammation. But one of the main links I try to make here, or I, I guess broader problems, is if that we don't acknowledge that relationship and help fight against a state of chronic inflammation when it is happening in the body, then over time, that is likely to perturb that normal regulation of our neurotransmitters and the way that our body regulates hormones and produces and regulates those neurotransmitters. So it's hard to say a directly causing problems in our mental health, but the evidence is accumulating to that point where we can start to make that case that it it, if not as contributing to poor mental health outcomes, in, in some cases, chronic inflammation very well may, may, may be causing major depression. 
Well, we can just, uh, from a simple exercise, we know if when we eat shit food, yeah, in the moment we might feel great for a second, but 30 minutes, one hour, two hours later, we feel sluggish, we feel like shit, we feel tired, you know, like a sugar crash. And we know that connection between, um, you know, food and, and mental health. And then sometimes fasting, not eating for long periods of time will actually give you a boost of energy uh, and make you clear and feel good as well. But we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit. But yeah, just from that simple exercise, as we know that food food is a changer of moods and, and food can make you feel good and, and can make you feel bad as well. Um, um, in chapter three, you, you jump into the second brain. So those who don't know what the second brain is, Jason, tell us what what is the second brain? Yeah, I think it's just such an interesting and almost provocative term. You know, a lot of folks maybe never heard of that, the second brain. Um, so that, first of all, is just a term that a lot of sci- some, excuse me, some researchers, some scientists are referring to as our intestinal tract. Now, the more proper term, what they're broadly referring to as is, is um, or a little more proper term, is our gut-brain axis. Um, so, now, what is the gut-brain axis? What is that describing is that, that strong means of communication between our brain and the whole, over 100 million nerve cells that connect our brain to our digestive tract. So there's that strong link of communication. I like to think of it almost like a highway of communication where there's this constant traveling of of chemical messengers that are communicating, so to speak, between our brain and our quote unquote second brain intestinal tract. Yeah, great. And um, you hear this a lot now. They talk about the the microbiome and um, you know gut health. Is there anything you can teach us about what the the microbiome is, and you know how do we how do we balance it, and how how do we protect our internal ecosystem? Perfect segue there, because the gut microbiome is that other piece of major piece of the discussion there of that gut brain axis. So it's not simply all about those nerve cells, but it's arguably the bigger piece of that discussion of our gut brain axis. Uh, is, is that gut microbiome you just mentioned there. So what are we talking about there? That's just basically that community of different bacteria that lives within our intestinal tract. So we all we we have a skin gut or excuse me a skin microbiome, an oral mouth microbiome, our gut microbiome is particularly significant in our immune health and our mental health. Um, and this one's a little more theoretical. We don't have clear answers, but I'm fascinating with understanding future health implications of autoimmune health disorders. That's a big question mark. Not quite as clear in science, but I'm fascinated. And once we start protecting our gut health is what I'm saying, I think that's going to help us be able to better treat autoimmune disorders. Fingers crossed. I couldn't say that with much certainty. Yeah, let's 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 go into that. And it's uh, as I said, it is a good segue. You talk about in the book about um, I like this little quote: "We need to put the fire out first before we rebuild the house." And uh, that's from the that's another quote that you you put in there. And it talks about um, you know you got gut health issues. You know, uh, know the problem before start taking action. Let's jump into some of the common medical conditions to address. Uh, which people are suffering from, you know, what's the difference between IBS and, and IBD? Um, for the first one, it's irritable uh, bowel syndrome. But yeah, let's let's go through the differences of those and how can people prevent those particular chronic diseases and, you know, help treat them if, if they're currently experiencing those problems. Yeah. And, and just a little caveat on the treatment. I had to be careful with how I acknowledge that one because that I, I feel is a little more within the scope of an integrative and functional medicine practitioner. Now, although that's the direction I'm headed, that's not the direction I'm at or where I'm at currently in my clinical practice. So there's a little bit of bridge in terms of conventional Western medicine and some of the confines with where I practice. And then integrative and functional medicine is a little more novel and different different modalities of treatment that is considered. So I got to be careful when I present that because what I discussed in there is a little more within the realm of integrative and functional medicine. So I tried to just more take a cursory look at that and just let my reader know that there are some potential solutions out there. You might not be getting them in this direction when you're looking, but you know, you might have to go seek out an integrative and functional medicine practitioner. So there is that caveat. And, you know, as far as the treatment goes, I had to be very limited with what I did, would present and discuss there because it, I would say at the moment it's still a little bit outside of my scope of practice, but I took an objective look just to at least research and present it. 
Yeah, I understand. Yeah. So what, what's the what's the biggest difference between uh, IBD and IBS? Thank you. Yeah, I went on a tangent off of your question. Um, no, that's cool. So IBS, um, I don't remember the, the numbers, you know, but I want to say at, I, I think it's at least 8%. That's probably a conservative number, if I remember correctly. Um, folks in the United States deal with the irritable bowel syndrome. You know, so it's a prevalent problem in developed nations all around. And I, I attribute largely to a standard American diet. We can't always say it's causing it. Again, we cannot say that um, because stress can contribute to irritable bowel syndrome. Poor sleep. There's, other, again, other factors that can contribute to that. Um, but what is irritable bowel syndrome? Basically, that means when we're dealing with chronic irregular bowel movements, whether that's constipation most of the time, diarrhea, loose bowel movements, maybe it goes back and forth. You know, I unfortunately help a lot of folks. They're dealing with that. It's just one or the other. It goes back and forth. And for years, that's kind of all they've known growing up or since adolescence. Those are the some of the more challenging um, consults I have where I help folks try to get to the root of that. And we, we try to find some solutions and really try to troubleshoot those long-term years of irregular bowel movements they've been having. And as I try to make the case in the book, again, the, the link is not crystal clear, but it, there's that correlation. When we have irritable bowel syndrome, we are more likely to feel anxious, depressed. So again, we can't say it's causing, but we have to stop and appreciate that link in research. And when we fix one, we're likely to see improvements in the other is my argument. Yeah, one of the reasons why I wanted to ask that question is, isn't it fascinating that people just get used to their bowels and their gut and, you know, we sort of eat the same foods weekly, fortnightly, over and over again. Uh, people can have the same breakfast seven days a week, but if you gave them the same dinner seven days a week, they'd freak out. But we just get used to um, what foods do X to our gut and our bowels as well, and we think that's normal. But one of the topics in the book that you talk about, which is really great, is um, is the elimination diet, and you talk about the four R's of gut healing. Can we dive into the four R's? And I'll give you I'll give you each one. First, you talk about uh, remove foods and other factors harmful to your gut. Uh, do you want to explore about the four R's of gut healing? Yeah, let me just pull it up just so I'm refreshing my memory. It's been uh, a little yeah, bit. Yeah, that's cool. To yeah, well, I'll go through it. So first, it's it's remove, replace, rebalance, and repair. Um, so yeah, just just remove. So what do you do with uh, with clients that you have first? Let's 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 talk about that. Yeah, so you know, I first have to take a proper assessment of their lifestyle. You know, so again, if they're sleeping three hours a day, and we're just going to focus on diet. I don't know if we're going to see much improvement, you know, so I first want to make sure they're taking care of themselves. They're sleeping. Are they doing any sort of physical activity? Are they connecting and so forth? So I have to take note of that before I talk about diet change, first of all. Um, and then sometimes, frankly, we'll start off on work on sleep hygiene before we even want to talk, dive into elimination diet, frankly. You know, sometimes we want to get out and just get 10 minutes exposure of the sun and just get outside and move your body before we're talking about an elimination. So, again, it all- What's, what is what is sleep hygiene? If for people going, what, what is sleep hygiene? What do you mean by that? Uh, basically, just some general tips that, you know, to keep in mind that can help us get the best quality and, and, uh, and enough sleep. You know, so for good health, we all should be getting about seven to nine hours of sleep, grown adults. Um, now there's certain things like, for example, shutting down the light at least that phone or that light on our phone in front of our face at least two, three hours before we go to bed, that will help that natural production of melatonin more, more, uh, stay regulated more in our normal circadian rhythm, as opposed to we keep that light right before we go to bed, we're going to have producing less melatonin, harder to get to sleep. That's just one example of sleep hygiene tip. Yeah. So do we, when we start removing things from our diet, it, do you uh, work with sort of a food diary and uh, a symptom log as well? So you, you, you write that in the book a little bit? Yeah, that, that's a, a pretty eye-opening exercise, I find, uh, you know, because then we can start to find those patterns. You know, maybe, maybe they track their diet for the first few weeks that they try an elimination diet. And then that second week, we start to notice some improvements in symptoms. And then maybe they had a slip up that next day. And then suddenly it got a lot worse, you know, so we can start to make that link. And then maybe a month later when they reintroduce, 
you know, they've maybe seen some significant improvements. That's when we start to use that diet, essentially that elimination diet as a tool is essentially what it is. It's used as a tool in clinical practice to help us find some release, A, but also some answers for lifelong success about which foods we essentially want to maybe reintroduce and then we can keep a green light, continue to eat those just fine because you're no longer reacting to them versus highlighting exactly which ones those were problematic to the individual. Yeah, got it. Yeah, we're jumping on to replace. You talk about sort of uh, replacing with healing, nourishing foods. What are some of the common foods that uh, you tell your clients to replace with? Or, or for my audience listening, what would some foods, um, some really nourishing, healthy foods that they can introduce into their diet? Give us a, a couple of tips and I'll talk about some of the things that I've started to introduce into my diet as well. Yeah, yeah. So again, it depends on the individual and where they're at and how broad of an elimination diet they may have had to have taken. You know, for example, I would say the more um, less challenging elimination diet is to maybe just target wheat and dairy, since those are common problems for people and their digestive concerns. So maybe we just target those two. And then we reintroduce those one by one. However, if we're taking a broad a more of a broad a, a approach and we eliminate maybe all of the or majority of like the common uh, uh most common food allergens and we go on a low fodmap for example then the healing foods are going to be generally the low fodmap compliant foods which are going to be uh certain types of fruit certain types of veggies certain types of grains that are considered low fodmap and less likely to cause some of those symptoms while we're trying some of those healing um, practices and regimens. So again, again, I got to be careful and not give too much details because this is a um, more of an integrative and functional medicine practice. Uh, but I am bridging that gap where I'm studying integrative and functional medicine and I'm slowly but sure, surely helping people with these trials more and more in clinical practice over the past year or two. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And just on a personal note, um, you know, I've been experimenting with diet for, you know, a long, long time, probably 20 plus years. And when I say experimenting with diet, I mean, going on diets, getting off diets, trying this diet, trying that diet, uh, fasting, you know, the keto diet, whatever diet you want, and sort of up and down with the weight, up and down with the energy levels, up and down with the moods and slowly, but surely trying to balance that out over time as well and not go on a diet, but more of a lifestyle change. Just yesterday, I made, I think, 21 frozen packets of smoothies. And when I say smoothies, I've got pure vegetables in one and I'm talking shots, like 150 mil to 200 mil of just pure great organic vegetables. The other one is 150 grams of or just a packet of uh, fruits. And the other one is um, greens as well. So putting them in the, the Nutribullet and having that in the morning as well, just before uh, starting the day, um, giving me that energy boost. So I'm trying something new now and introducing um, you know more fruits, vegetables, and greens into my diet through the process of, uh, of you know using the Nutribullet. Do you have any tips or any uh, personal thoughts on the difference between juicing smoothies and just getting those really rich foods and, and nutrients uh, into the body uh do you do you think that's the way to go as well yeah, um, yeah do you think that's yeah yeah good question i like what you're doing because i think what you're doing is one of the keys to success of a lot of us that a lot of us need is just making sure just to plan ahead and uh you know thinking what what do we want to eat tomorrow you know maybe maybe some of that involves food prep you know you're, you're prepping maybe just your fruit and veggies, maybe just your lean proteins, maybe your starches, maybe you do them all. However, what works for you, but you're thinking ahead of yourself and you're, you're putting that time and effort. So you're going to better hold yourself accountable to those healthy choices over the next week. So that's first. Well, one of the, what, yeah, sorry. yeah, sorry. Apologies cutting you off. Yeah, one of the things I'm doing, I'm not I'm not removing or uh, replacing any of the foods. I'm just literally adding, making sure I get 150 mils or maybe two, like a real sh small shot of powerful greens, powerful fruit, 
or and powerful, you know, veggies as well um, that you normally wouldn't consume in, in those vast amounts. But I'm not juicing, so I'm not I'm ni- missing any of that. I'm literally nutribullet in that, and I know it's it's straight into the bloodstream because you know that's not the way the body produces it. But it's better in the body than out the body. And the problem is we normally just get stuck into these patterns and lifestyle and dietary, um, you know. Oh, I'm hungry. Let's order Uber Eats. Or, hey, there's food there. Let's eat. Or, is that a party? There's 17 pizzas. Let's eat a pizza. We're sort of not planning to get those nutrients, those micronutrients into the body. So, I'm going to play around with that a little bit and then start maybe uh, removing some things in the diet. But that is replacing, not replacing, it's adding on. The next one you talk about in the in the four R's is, is rebalance. Talk us to talk a little bit about rebalance you talk about gut microbiome increasing levels of healthy bacteria and um yeah what do you suggest with rebalance yeah and i don't know if you want to go back because i didn't i know i didn't quite answer your question i could give you a more like terse answer i can like the difference oh please sorry yeah go okay, ahead yeah I, definitely yeah, I, I kind of thank wanna, you yeah um so you asked me the difference of what uh smoothie versus juicing vegetables and fruits uh, yeah. So um, basically w- when we juice it, you know, it's more of that concentrated micronutrition. So we're going to take a lot of those important vitamins and minerals, as you suggested there. You know, so that can be a convenient way for some folks to get some of their micronutrition, especially folks who are just not interested in eating enough fruits and veggies. Sometimes that's the easier way. However, I would say it's, it's a little it's nutritionally inferior than that smoothie. That smoothie is going to be more balanced because it has those fibers that naturally occur. When we juice, we're going to throw away most of that fiber. Um, yeah, so- that's the one, that's the word I was looking for, fibers, yeah. Um, and I just think it's good as well. I mean, if you, I've juiced before. I've done the, you know, seven-day juice cleanse and lost, you know, five kilos, which is, um, you know, probably 10 pounds or something like that in, in American terms, Ben. But I put it back on within two weeks. You know, you felt good for a week. You know, you eliminated stuff. But, hey, you can't juice uh, four or five meals a day forever. Um, it's just not healthy. Um, yeah, so talk about sort of rebalancing and, re- and repairing as well before we jump on to the next one in the, in the four R's of gut healing. Yeah, so um, that third that third step in that four R's um, rebalance, and, and again, this is theoretical, so I got to be careful again how I present this. But my understanding of that rebalance, basically, it's helping build up those healthy, helpful strains of bacteria: bifidobacteria, lactobacillus, those different key strains of bacteria that we know confer health benefits that help us digest. Uh, and help us produce certain vitamins and so forth. So part of that is just eating the right foods and starting to get more of the right foods that help to build and rebuild that healthy gut microbiome we talked about earlier. So not just only is that including some probiotic sources of foods at that time it might include, um, but it also going to be the right types of fibrous foods. So we got to parse that out in clinic because that low FODMAP is a specific type of carbohydrate food. Some high fiber foods we got to back off for a period of time. Other ones we got to focus on. Those are the ones we want to reintroduce at that time that are going to start to fuel those healthy bacteria. In other words, prebiotics. Those fibers that we can't digest are prebiotic sources, which means it's fueling those healthy probiotics within our gut, helping rebuild that gut microbiome, which in turn is helping protect our immune system, fortify our immune system, protect our um, gut lining and so forth. Yeah, great. Yeah, thank you for uh, expanding that as well. Uh, next chapter, we, we you talk about sort of intermittent fasting, uh, ketogenic diet and supplements. But what I want to talk about is the different uh, different models of fasting. There's so many different fastings out there. The 16 and 8, you know, the 5 and 2, um, alternate day fasting. Um, what are your thoughts on fasting or what's the best recommendation i know it's individual but yourself personally um what's your experience with fasting and and what do you like to do when when you when you fast yourself yeah you know so i'm definitely a proponent myself um but you know i I gotta be careful because again i do present it as a tool in my book you know that's the way i wanted my reader to decide is ultimately is it helpful or is it harmful to you because i think it can be either or uh, depending on the situation who uses it and how they use fasting so to me, uh, and I also, I have my personal opinions versus what I have to be careful of, you know, what I do teach people, which is more consensual science that I've looked at objectively. 
So I got to be careful not to in, in, interject too much of my opinions into this question because it's a passionate area of mine. Yeah. Um, so, and I feel like you were asking a little more of my opinion. Um, was was that right? The first question there. Yeah, yeah. I'm interested in in, in what. Yeah, we'll take off the we'll take off the doctor hat for a second. Just uh, man to man. What what do you think? Yeah, I I think it's fascinating. You know, from a longevity perspective, because we're looking at you know one of the links in research that is most eye opening to me is that uh, autophagy process, which is basically uh, in layman's terms, it, it's our cellular recycling system. So it's that normal recycling and regenerating uh, from cellular debris within our biochemical systems. So to me, that's so fascinating from improving our future health and our longevity, even though we don't fully understand the significance of it. To me, it's so provocative and interesting because I think there's so much potential to impact longevity in the future when we do understand that science more more in depth than we do today. So there's that aspect that's most fascinating to me is the autophagy and um, the different uh, brain-derived neurotropic factor. For example, prolonged fasting, it can increase the BDNF, which is that neuroregenerative chemical in our body that helps our brain cells regenerate and repair. So to me, it's just so fascinating from a neurological health standpoint and a longevity health standpoint so many questions we have yet to to answer about potential therapeutic utility in the near future yeah i think we're designed to to go through periods of uh famine and feast as well especially in the human body and um the the body is designed to you know we, we we don't eat while we sleep and the body takes a nice break on repairing and when we wake up in the morning we actually uh, we feel good you know we we feel good and and some people you know take a while to eat breakfast i know i don't eat for the first sort of maybe two to two to three hours and i feel really good uh in that hunger sort of you know, it comes up. And some of the diets I do, I like the diet of um, the 16 and 8. Sometimes I like uh, eating in that eight-hour window and, you know, we'll skip breakfast. And, uh, you know, breakfast, if you break it down, means break the fast. Uh, I'm sure they know what they're talking about. And then sometimes having that 24-hour fast of going from dinner to dinner and skipping breakfast and then going, you know what, let's just skip lunch and, and power on through the day with no food. And, and that is a 24-hour fast as well. Um, I like that, that one too but yeah going going through you talk about some other great uh, principles in the book as well and uh, chapter six you said look let's just forget diet let's just talk about the three principles i'm going to do a bit of a speed round with you and i want you to expand on some of these principles so principle number one you talk about diets do not work it's the pattern that matters what do you have to say about that yeah well <laughs> my editor called me out on this she's like wait a second so you're recommending diets on this next chapter but we're saying diets do not work so let me parse that out for a second <laughs> Um, what I mean here is just kind of acknowledging the more fad diets and the crash diets that tend to be the more mainstream culture when we think of the word diet. So pausing to acknowledge that when I say the word diet, I mean something a little bit different than most folks do when they tend to think of restriction, deprivation, and rigid structure. I generally don't enforce that. So that's not my idea of a diet. What I'm saying here is that It's really the pattern that matters and crash diets nine times out of 10, they're not, or more than that, they're not the answer Um, that I'm not supporting those crash diets, those fad diets. But the more important question, let's take a look at the overall pattern. And yes, some of these quote unquote diets might be fine options for balanced patterns, but I'm arguing that it's more the pattern that matters here in this context. So it's not really... A specific diet that is necessarily the answer it's more how many fruits and vegetables are you eating throughout your average week you know how many different sources of lean proteins are you eating are you eating essential fats you know are you eating whole grains or are you mostly eating refined grains um, those are more important questions is what i'm arguing to answer than getting lost about what is the best or or the worst <laughs> diets out there you know, so what I tried to do is basically look at a handful of models, patterns that all had some common ground and that we all could agree on are, are just fine models to not only help with general health, 
but also protect our digestive health, protect our mental well-being, contribute to that whole big broader picture because they're just a general healthful model diet. Yeah, well said, well said. And in principle too, you talk about too much of a good thing is, uh, is not a good thing. Yeah, um, you know, I, I think this kind of reiterates that importance of avoiding crash diets or um, extreme diet changes because let me look at an example of like the carnivore diet. You know, I think that's, I don't even want to dive into the science of that, so I'm not going to go there right now, but that's just not at all balanced. You know, some people are claiming that if you eat way a bunch of meat, but you cut out all these other food groups, um, yeah, we might see some changes initially that we might be looking for, but at what cost? You know, if we eat way too much meat, there's some concerning research that shows that if we eat a lot large amounts of meat over years of time, that is increases our chances of getting cancer. So that's one, I guess, body of, of research that I try to expound on and look at it as an example that, again, let's go back to the balance. Let's go back to the pattern of a general balanced diet because if we're eating too much meat, if we're eating too much maybe fruits, that could cause diarrhea. That can cause some blood sugar problems. You know, so we got to be careful. And again, it's not focusing too much on individual food groups. It's more the bigger picture of eating a balanced diet. It's one of the main narratives that I'm trying to present and sell in this book. Yeah. And look, everyone's got a body and everyone eats and everyone's got gut health and everyone's got food problems. So, you know, we're, we're talking about a topic that's uh, prevalent to everyone 24 hours a day. Uh, it's feeling good and it's making that, you know, mental connection between uh, well-being and uh, gut health as well and food. Uh, and last principle number three is say, keep it simple. You know, plants are good. Talk to us uh, about plants. Yeah. I mean, that, that was one, what I found is a common ground. You know, I tried to explore all these different uh, what, what different influencers and different doctors and different dietitians are, you know, maybe suggesting as different alternatives or solutions to gut health, for example, is what I tried to take a bird's eye view at the different answers that are out there, however much validity or not there might be to them. I tried to take that bird's eye view. Now, what I did and I tried to walk away with was what is the, the clearest consensus I can take from all of the experts out there? And I would say that is that we all sh can agree that we should be eating a good portion of our diet coming from whole foods, plant-based. So that means fruits and vegetables every single day. That means eating mostly whole grains out of our grain-based foods. That means eating varied proteins. Maybe that includes animal proteins for you, maybe not, depending on how you want to approach it. Um, but varied proteins means nuts and seeds, fish maybe for most people. Not all, maybe. Um, olive oil, avocados, those different sources of essential fats. That's kind of what I found as that common ground, not just the plant-based foods, but a few other common grounds there that I would argue most all experts could at least agree on that common ground. So let's move forward with that, with that common ground. Yeah, I agree as well. And uh, just to wrap up the the book and, and the podcast as well, the, the last thing you sort of talk about is is self-care and wellness. And I like how you put that into that little image uh, in the book, which we'll, we'll just touch on it. You talk about uh, emotional, spiritual, intellectual, physical, environmental, financial, occupational, and social as well with the, with the circle of wellness. Um, do you want to tie those together and sort of talk to us about the, the eight dimensions of wellness? Yeah, you know, I just thought this was a good guiding model to help us see the broader picture of wellness. And I got this through SAMHSA, which is substance abuse, mental health. Um, I can't remember the rest of services, it. Services, services Administration. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, oh, it's right in front of me. <laughs> my, my resource right there, citation. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I thought this was just a good uh, kind of visualization because I can't imagine any, many of my readers are going to identify with all of them. But I imagine most all of my readers will identify with at least a couple of those and find those as maybe shortcomings in their life. You know, maybe they're, you know, they're not, you know, they're falling short in their physical wellness. Maybe it's their financial wellness they need to work on for a little bit. Maybe it's social connections. Maybe it's spiritual. You know, those are different aspects that can affect our overall well-being. So I really wanted to take that broad perspective to understand that. 
nutrition is is just one significant piece of our physical, our emotional, mental, our well being. But not only is it those, but it can impact these other dimensions, and these are interrelated. When we look at this image, we can see that they're all connected, and that you know I think it's just important to recognize the different dimensions of wellness and. Um, Again, maybe the, maybe we need to focus on sleep or different connecting in different ways before we overhaul our whole diet and realize that there's other ways that we can contribute to our mental well-being and not boil it all down to diet and exercise. Yeah, definitely. And I think touching on that, you know, if someone doesn't have the, um, let's look at it, the occupational or the, the financial um, in their life, let's say that's a, an area of low they might go to the extreme of food and diet and start consuming, uh, you know, crappy foods that make them feel good in the short term because they're they're not you know they're not good in their day to day life or you know they're missing that emotional con- or someone that doesn't have social connection doesn't have a job, has got no money, you know, it's sad all the time emotionally has no not spiritual you know and doesn't read books, not intellectual and doesn't move their body, you know they they're going to revert back to foods that make them feel good in the present but not necessarily be well as well. Uh, so I think, yeah, definitely thank you for putting that in. It all ties together. Yeah, an amazing book. So tell us a little bit about where people can sort of find the book uh, and, and find you online as well. What's the best place people can go out there and, and purchase the book, Foods for Thought? Yeah, and first of all, thank you so much for the review. That means a lot to me. And uh, and it is pretty widely available on uh, the mainstream outlets as far as online. That would be Amazon, Amazon. Uh, uh, Barnes and Nobles online, um, and then um, I'm, a few other mainstream online. I can't recall off the top of my head. Brick and mortar. It's only currently, to my knowledge, it's in Arizona markets. So I'm in quite a few uh, Phoenix and the surrounding Arizona bookstores, but um, online, it's those major chains. Yeah, and where do you spend most of your time uh, online, socially yourself? If people want to connect with you to say hi or pick your brain or just follow your activity. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, first of all, I'm not quite as present as I would like to be, but I'm hoping to change that soon. I'm hoping to engage more and get more present on social. But um, I am. Oh, my website is first of all is foodsforthoughtrd.com, and that's foods with an S. Uh, and then handle social media handle would also be foodsforthought underscore rd. Mainly on Instagram right now. Um, that's really the only one that I engage with, but hoping to. Hoping to expand on that um, this year. Yeah, perfect. Well, for more of out there, yeah, go out, uh, check out this book, Food for Thoughts. Uh, it's great. Uh, I read it. Jason's uh, done some great work. And yeah, appreciate all the work and continue what you're doing with uh, all your patients and all your clinical work as well. So yeah, thank you for uh, putting the book together. Uh, and thanks for being a guest on the Best Book Bits podcast and uh, we'll chat soon. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. Absolutely. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, it's a pleasure to join you. Thank you. Jason. All right, no worries. Bye.